Proudly, we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Air Force. Our story is entitled, Air Force Wife. This is the story of Kathy Russell and her husband Bob, an Air Force captain, at a moment when their lives are troubled and tangled. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... Young man, there's a future in flight. Today's jet age offers unlimited opportunities for young men between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half who are high school graduates and otherwise qualified. Yes, you can proudly wear the silver wings and fly the mighty aircraft of your United States Air Force when you've completed your training. For full details, visit your nearest Air Force base or your nearest United States Air Force recruiting station today. Remember, the sooner you apply, the sooner you fly. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Air Force Wife. It's early in the morning at Eastman Air Force Base. It's a little chilly. The sun has just begun to rise. An Air Force transport plane is standing on the ramp, its doors open and waiting. There are a number of Air Force men getting ready to go on a mission. The pilot, Captain Bob Russell, and his co-pilot, Lieutenant Bert Tilson, are checking over their flight plan. Standing outside the operations office is Kathy Russell, Bob's wife. Near her are some other wives, and Sue Collins, Lieutenant Tilson's girl. Hi, honey. Well, we're all set. Take care of yourself. Oh, sure, don't I always? I guess you do. <laughs> sort of a habit to say that. Yeah, I know, the way I always say to you, be careful now and don't <laughs> drive too fast. You huh? know I don't. I know, I know. It's just that I get a mental picture of you getting into the car after you see me off and being in a hurry to get home to the kids and not paying enough no, attention to the road. Silly, I'm always careful. Well, you keep right on being careful. All huh? right, I will. And don't forget now, if you see Maggie Clark, thank her particularly for that plan. I will, and if I don't see her, I'll see the Major for sure. Yeah, you know the way you men are about delivering messages from wives. I'll remember. Yeah. Well, it's time to get the wheels off. Goodbye. Mm. <laughs> now, look, you know where you can reach me, and watch mm. out for Danny's cough. Mm -hmm. He woke up again in the night and said his throat hurt and he was thirsty. All right, I'll watch it. Goodbye. Well, you're going to stay here? I always watch until the plane's out of sight. Oh. Okay. We'll take care of things. Hi there, Kathy. Oh, hi, Sue. Huh. You look all quiet and composed and dry-eyed. Why not? I mean, I hate to see Bob leave, but he'll be back in a couple of days. As will Bert. I know. You know, if Bert and I ever do get married, I'm going to have trouble with him about your husband. Hmm? He's pleased to be Bob's co-pilot. Ruins his ambition. <laughs> well, I think your Bert, like Bob, takes his flying seriously. I don't see how you can stay so composed, seeing Bob go away like that. Don't you worry about him? Of course I do, Sue, but I'll tell you a secret, something I discovered a long time ago. All women worry about their husbands when they're away, whether they go on a trip or go to an office to work. Oh, but, but don't you worry more about Bob going off this way? Sue, my father is sales manager for a firm. He goes away every couple of weeks. Mother worries about him more than I do about Bob. Oh, but at least your mother stays in one place. She isn't picked up and moved around every time she gets used to living somewhere. Oh, so that's it. That's why you and Bert haven't gotten married? I guess so. My family, they don't object to Bert. They like him, but they'd rather I married someone from town here who would stay in one spot. Oh, I see. It's a problem. I love Bert, but I love my family, too. And you do move around a lot. Yes, that's true, we do. Look, Sue, I get tired of moving sometimes, but there's another side to it, you know. But your children. 
I'd want kids, but I'd like them to settle down in one place, go to one school and stay there. I used to think that, too. But kids are more flexible than we give them credit for, and this moving around has been good for them. You've lived so many places. Really, I think it's been good for Danny and will be good for Sandra, too, when she's old enough to appreciate it. They've seen more of the country than they would have. They know more. Makes them, well, better Americans. They're more adaptable, more mature. You make it sound wonderful. Well, it has its own problems and its own advantages. Look, if you want some tips on how to handle your family, my mother's visiting me for a few days. Why don't you drop over and talk to her? I'd hmm? love to, thanks. This was her first chance to visit us since we've moved here. I think she came to see how we're settled and whether she can help. Better get home or she'll be wondering what happened to me. I'm glad to see everything so nice here, Kathy. The home looks fine. You seem pretty well settled in. Well, you know me, Mother. I take roots in a hurry. I do know you, Kathy. You do what you have to do without any complaints. I'm proud of my girl. Do you know any people here yet? Mm-hmm, some. A few of the service wives, and I'd met Sue Collins before we moved here. And of course, some of the neighbors have called. You'll always make out wherever you are. This seems like a nice town, what I've seen of it. I'm more worried about Danny. Oh, you're just enjoying being the worrying grandmother. I worry, too, a little bit every time either kid runs a fever, but I'm not the worrying type. Besides, he sounded better tonight. The aspirin brought his temperature down. Well, you're probably right. I wanted to talk to you about something else, dear. Dad has been talking to me. Mr. Williamson's been talking to him. Dad isn't having any trouble, is he? Oh, of course not. Far from it. Business is doing well. It's been expanding all the time. Mr. Williamson was saying that he could use another good man. It wasn't anything definite. But I thought if Bob should ever decide to leave the service, this might be a good time. And a word from Dad... Oh, Mother, I really don't think Bob would be interested. I'll tell him about it when he gets back, but he's crazy about his work. What do you think? Well, you know, I like some aspects of this life, and other parts of it have disadvantages. But in the service, we're all in the same business, so to speak, husbands and wives. I'm more a part of his everyday life than I would be if he had a civilian job, and that appeals to me as it would to any woman who loves her husband. Of course, dear, if that's the way you feel. I just thought it might be an opportunity for Bob. Well, Mother, he's been building a career in the field he loves, a career he couldn't duplicate elsewhere. It's something he's thought over carefully. We both have. Oh, is that Danny? Oh, I'll go up and see. I guess he woke. I'll be right back. I don't like the way he looks, Mother. I didn't take his temperature, but I know he's running a real fever now. Oh, dear. I'm going to call up the medical duty officer at the base. Danny keeps calling for Bob. I look at it, Bert. If Sue really wants to marry you, she won't let anything like that stand in the way. Well, I think that, too, sometimes, Bob. But she does love me. I know that. Why don't you talk it over with Kathy when we get back? Thanks. Oh, I've taken up a lot of your time talking about my troubles. Oh, think nothing of it. Everyone likes to be asked for advice. And besides which, we like you and Sue. Well, we ought to be over Clinton about now. Right. We're over the Clinton radio now. Oh, fine. I'll make a position report and check ahead for Culver weather. Clinton Radio, this is Air Force Niner 212. Position report over your station at 1 2, 8,000 feet. Victor Foxtrot Romeo, Eastman to Culver. Estimate Pulaski intersection at 2 9. Roger. Air Force Niner 212 on your position. Clinton, altimeter 2989. Clinton Radio, out. Clinton Radio, Air Force Niner 212. Request latest weather at Jackson and Culver. Over. Well? A uh, cold front directly across our flight path. Culver's socked in. We have rain, sleet, severe turbulence, and pilot reports of severe clear ice between here and destination from the ground up. What should we do? Turn back, or do you think we can make it to Danville? Well, call Clinton and request a change of flight plan to instrument conditions and change our destination to Danville, which is behind the front. Danville's beginning to clear. We should be able to set down there until Culver opens up. Roger. Our compass heading will be 110. 
What altitude shall I request? Major McDill, this is my mother, Mrs. Johnson. How do you do, Mrs. Johnson? How do you do, sir? And where's the patient? Upstairs. Lead the way? Yes, sir. How's he feeling now? Well, he's asleep again. Mm. I hate to wake him. You uh, took his temperature? Yes, 104 and 7 tenths. Hmm. How long has he been sick? Oh, here we are. Yeah. Well, he started coughing yesterday. It wasn't anything much. It didn't seem to be anyway, and then... Today it hung on, so I kept him in bed. I see. I gave him an aspirin this morning, another at noon, and by dinner time his temperature had dropped to under 100. Mm -hmm. Gave him another aspirin before he went to sleep tonight. Then he woke up hot and crying a little while ago. And the uh, cough, that was all you noticed? Tonight when he woke up, he was complaining his throat was sore. Mm -hmm. How did it look? Not too bad, but he didn't like me looking at it. Said it hurt him to move his head. Well, I think we'll take his temperature again. Now, here you are, son. Just turn over. Oh, oh darling, it's that's all right. right. Son, it's all right. Your mother's right here. Yeah. Didn't even wake up then. He just cried. Yes, that's just as well. No reason for him to wake up. Is there anything you need? Anything I can get for you? No. No, nothing at all. All right, let's see that temperature now. Hmm. What is it? It's uh, up a little more. Closer to 105 now. Oh. I think I'd feel better, and so would he and you, if we had him at the hospital. You have a base phone up here? Uh, yes, in the other room. Here, I'll show you. Hello, who's this? Oh, Burns. This is Major McDill. I'm at Captain Russell's house. I want the ambulance here right away. Uh, 311 Maple Street. And have a room ready at the hospital. No, it's not the captain. It's his boy, Danny. Goodbye. I suppose it is best. Uh, can I... May I come, too? Well, of course, Kathy. And now, while we're waiting, you'd better pack a bag for him. And I'd better head over to the hospital so I can get a few things ready for him. All right, Doctor. By the way, do you expect Captain Russell back tonight? No, do you think I should call him? I'm not sure I could reach him. Oh, no, no, I wouldn't bother him yet. Well, I'd better get going. The ambulance should be here in a few minutes. All right, I'll be there. Bob. Bob, I need you so. You know where you can reach me. And watch out for Danny's cough. He woke up again in the night and said his throat hurt and he was thirsty. <laughs> Bob. Bob. <laughs> You are listening to the proudly we hailed production, Air Force Wife. We will return in just a moment for the second act. Here's an important announcement for all high school graduates. If you can qualify as an aviation cadet, you can become a commissioned officer in the United States Air Force. You'll earn more than $5,000 a year. As an aviation cadet, you'll get the most thorough training in the world in the field of jet aviation. You'll be flying jets yourself within 18 months flying easily and safely. A skilled jet pilot with a new world of aviation before you. The training is rugged, the discipline rigid, but when you graduate with your commission, you'll have a career ahead of you that will take you far in both military and commercial aviation. So, if you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, single and a high school graduate, you may qualify for this training and a wonderful future in the jet age. Visit your nearest United States Air Force recruiting station today for complete details. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now we present the second act of Air Force Wife. <music> Kathy went to the hospital with Danny in the ambulance and Danny has been put to bed in the room the Major reserved for him. Kathy and Major McDill are talking in the waiting room at the end of the hall, their voices low. They're in a hospital, and it's late at night. I don't like this either, Kathy. We'll make him as comfortable as we can, but there's no sense letting you think I'm not worried. 
Well, what can you do? Well, I don't want to do a thing until I've checked. I called Dr. Waterbury and asked him to come over. He's a civilian. He's regarded the best pediatrician in this area. But you think you know what it is? Yes, I... I believe it's polio. Polio. I'm afraid I knew it the minute I called for a doctor. I didn't want to say anything till I was pretty sure. But, well, you're a pretty level-headed girl, Kathy, and the best thing is for you to know the truth. Oh, there's Dr. Waterbury coming down the hall now. You wait here, we'll be back. It's too early to tell what will happen, Mrs. Russell. You know, most polio attacks pass without doing any damage to the patient. Isn't there something that can be done? Nothing that I know of that hasn't been done already. You can be sure he's getting the very best possible care. He'll probably sleep through the night now, Kathy. Why don't you go home and try to get some sleep? Do I have to go? I mean, can't I stay here? Well, I see no reason why not. I'll stop by in the morning. If anything comes up, just call me. I will. And thank you, Doctor, for coming over. Glad to be of service if I can, although I haven't done anything except agree with you. Good night, Mrs. Russell. Now you try to settle down for the night, Kathy. I'm going to give you something to help you sleep. The nurse will be in and out, and I won't be far away. There doesn't seem to be much change. We should know what we're up against within the next 24 hours. You saw the boy, Mrs. Russell? Yes, I went in. Hmm. He seemed to be asleep. Restless, but sleeping. Yes, that's right. Now, why don't you go home, Kathy? You have another child there, and there's not much you can do here. You can come back later, and we'll call you if anything comes up, of course. I know, but he might wake up and be frightened, not knowing where he is. Well, that's possible, but the chances are he won't awaken for several more hours. And you'd rather be here then, wouldn't you? Well, yes, if you think that's sensible. You'll feel better if you go home for a few hours. If there were anything you could do here to help him, I, I would suggest it. I suppose I might as well go home. This might be a long siege, Mrs. Russell. There's no point in your thinking that you have to be here every minute of the day. Your part will come later when you'll have to help him recover. Is it all right if I go in and say goodbye? Well, of course, Kathy. And thank you. Thank you both so much. Am I wrong, Doctor, or was he breathing badly? Yeah, I thought that's why you wanted Mrs. Russell to leave. Mm -hmm. The diaphragm seems to be affected. Well, I didn't want to say anything until I was sure. Mm. Now... Do you have an iron lung available? Well, there's one in the hospital, but it's in use at present. It's the only one in town. I could call my office to check, but I know it's the only one. Should I try to get one shipped in? I think we should keep a close watch on the patient and start with artificial respiration if it becomes necessary. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I'll try to get an iron lung sent in here. That'll be fine, Doctor. And all we can do, if the breathing becomes affected, is to try to keep the lungs working by one means or another for as long as possible. Yes, that's about it. As with most medical treatment, all we're trying to do is to help nature. Right. Well, I'll make arrangements to have an iron lung flown in and have someone available for artificial respiration until then. You'll be within reach if necessary. I won't be more than 10 or 15 minutes away from here any time of day. house looks just the same, so does the street. You go through all kinds of things, and yet a street or a house looks just the same. So much has happened. It's still so early. Nobody seems to be up. Milk and the paper's still by the front door. Mother must be asleep upstairs. Sandra, too. I don't want to wake them up. No... No, it can't be. Eastman transport missing. Transport from Eastman Air Force Base, which left here early yesterday morning, is unreported at its destination. The plane is said to be carrying 16 people, including the crew, all Air Force personnel. The plane was last... Oh, you're home, Kathy. I didn't hear you come in. How's Danny? What did the... Oh, you have the paper. Was there anything? Danny's about the same... There's a storm where Bob was going, a plane from here, unreported. Bob's all right, I know he is. Well, what do you know? Why didn't you tell me? I heard about the storm on the radio last night. When you called and said you were going to stay in the hospital, I didn't see any reason to mention it, not knowing. Danny must be better or you wouldn't be home now. They seemed to think he was better. 
I thought he was worse. Oh. Uh, Colonel Morton called last night, too. He said to tell you he'd had a report on the plane. It had radioed last night that they were heading for another base to, well, to wait out the storm. He said he'd be in touch with you as soon as he heard anything more. Has he called again? No, dear. But it's all right, Kathy. It's going to be all right. Mother, is there something the matter with me? I don't even feel like crying. I just feel numb. That's not Danny they're talking about. I just don't seem to be able to feel anymore. It's shock. You're still my Kathy. <gasps> what? Oh, it's the phone. I'll get it. Probably. No, I'll friend. take it. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Russell? Speaking. Uh, this is Colonel Morton, Mrs. Russell. I, I just spoke to Bob. Is he all right? He's all right. Oh. Everyone's all right. I've had a long talk with Bob. Without going into details, he can tell you those when he gets back. They ran into a storm and couldn't land at their original destination. So they went on to their alternate, Danville. The severe storm had disrupted all communications. He called in the morning as soon as he could get through. The way you tell it, it doesn't sound like anything. I couldn't imagine a pilot as good as Bob getting into anything he couldn't get out of. I tried to tell that to your mother. Oh, yes, Bob said he was worried about your boy. He's in the hospital, Colonel. I called the medical officer at the base. Major McDill came over and took him to the hospital. They think it's polio. Oh. Is there anything I can do? If you need anything, just call me. Even if you don't, call me and let me know how he's getting on. I'm glad we have Major McDill here. He's a very competent man. <laughs> Major, there you are. They won't let me in the room. Is anything wrong? Well, he's having some trouble breathing. There's been a team in there for the last half hour giving him artificial respiration. He stopped breathing? No, but we were afraid he might. Is he awake? Yes, in a way. That is, he's conscious, but he's pretty drowsy. He doesn't seem to be in any pain. But isn't there something I could do to help? I feel so useless. No, I'm afraid not. The artificial respiration looks pretty frightening, but... It doesn't need to be as bad as it looks. This artificial respiration, how long can you keep that up? Indefinitely, if we have to. There's a whole air base here, Kathy. Isn't that what they use an iron lung for? Yes. The only one here is in use. We have the only one in the county. I phoned away. There's one en route here now by plane. Should be here Major any minute. McDill, please come to Ward 6B. Major McDill, please come to Ward oh, 6B. Well, maybe that's it now. <laughs> And so, Kathy, it looks much better now. Oh, you don't know how grateful I am to you. Not to me, to the Major, if anyone. He's been handling this right along. He was the one who had that iron lung brought in. I won't say it's going to be easy sailing, Kathy, but the worst is over now. Danny will live. Not only that, but it looks as though he won't have any permanent damage. It's going to be a long road back, but he'll make it. He even looks so much better now. Of course he does, Kathy. He is better. No, I was afraid to look at him, almost. I thought an iron lung would be, oh, I don't know, uncomfortable or frightening. It's amazing how fast he started to recover. Well, that's what kids can do. They have so much strength, so much recuperative power in their little bodies. Then, too, he was interested. As soon as he began to feel better, he wanted to know all about what was going on. I think that's what's made me feel so much better. It wasn't just that he looked better and you said he was all right, but he got back his curiosity and interest. Yes. Well, he's sleeping now, quietly. You know, with luck, we'll have him out of that contraption in a few days. And for that, you can thank the Air Force. Danny couldn't have gotten any more care if he'd been, well, a general. You don't have to tell me that. I knew it, expected it. Well, we try to take care of our personnel. And you, Kathy, and Danny are a part of our personnel as much as your husband, Bob, is. I still can't get over Colonel Morton calling me that way, just as though Bert and I were already married. Made me think, Kathy. I I've been arguing with my family about Bert. You know, I was impressed. There must be something to this business of being an Air Force wife. The way all the others rallied round and, and then Colonel Morton calling me that way. Uh, what did you mean when you said I was one of the family? Well, you are, almost. And you'll find it's quite a family, Sue. They'll all act like that, even when you don't know them you'll find you've got a family that reaches all the way around the globe. Only you won't realize it unless... 
or until you're in trouble. Oh, that must be the call I put in for Dad. Hello? Yes, I was calling Mr. Johnson. Hi, Dad. Yes, Danny's much better. He's going to be all right. Oh, Mother told you already. Good, that'll be wonderful. We'll see you tomorrow, then. Bob should be here by then, too. <laughs> yes, I'll tell him about Mr. Williamson and what he said, but you'd better tell him yourself, because I'm against it. You know Bob. He'll stay in the Air Force as long as there's a job to be done, and he thinks he's capable of doing it, and I'll help him. <laughs> no, no, I know you won't interfere, but you take it up with him. I know what he'll say, though. <laughs> All right, goodbye, Dad. I couldn't help hearing a little of what you said, Kathy. I think I understand. No, Sue, you can't really understand more than a little bit of it. Not yet, anyway. Not until you really are an Air Force wife and know what it means to see everybody pull together when there's trouble. Not until you know the, the feeling you get, the security you feel from knowing there's an organization like this built to defend our country, but that isn't too big or impersonal to put its whole resources in back of helping one sick child. Proudly, we hail the women behind the men in the Air Force, the Air Force wives. Attention, high school graduates. If you're not afraid of hard work, if you can take rigid training six days a week for 52 weeks, then you've got what it takes to be an aviation cadet. And if that's the case, why, your future's all set. Aviation cadets graduate as Air Force lieutenants, earn more than $5,000 a year. To qualify, you must be a high school graduate between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, single and in excellent physical and mental condition. Visit your local Air Force recruiting station for complete details. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this radio station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Mark Hamilton speaking, inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. Proudly We Hail.